what's up everybody welcome to another episode of the community farm alliance podcast i'm your host for the blacker berries series my name is vaughn barnes and i have two two guests today family mom son operation uh out of lexington kentucky green landing ky juana and james juana please tell me how did the farm get started but well, we bought some property in Cape Town, and Cape Town is a historical hamlet. And Fayette County has about 26 hamlets. So anytime you hear a name like Jonestown, Cape Town, Utterton Town, most time that's a hamlet. And a hamlet is a place where free slaves, when, people, when the slaves became free, they were not allowed to buy property. So in, uh, a man named uh, John Caton came to Cape Town, and he sold property to free slaves. So we bought some property out of Cape Town and wanted to build a house. And our property is kind of unique. It's like an L shape. So we're going to put the house on the big side of the L, and then we're just going to have all this land over here. So I decided in 2018 to start tilling some land because I always had a garden at home. So in 2018, I started tilling the dang land up, but I didn't put anything out until 2019. So I started a little small, uh, about 80 by 80 plot and received a grant from the Bay County Conservation to do a summer camp. And I thought, what better way to do with the land is to have a garden. So I created the garden and started calling it Green Landing. Um, and that's how it came about. And now we have three spots out there at Green. James, where do you fit into this whole picture? I'm kind of the manager behind the scenes, uh, social media handling director. I just kind of handle a lot of stuff as a, a gopher is what they would call it. So I just always there ready to answer the phone and get things that need to be got, come out and help when needs to be helped. And then I'm also running things at our Launchburg growing site, which we can talk about later about how we expand it to Launchburg. So you guys started in 2018. Is that when you guys got the property or was it before that that you had the property? We bought the property in 2016 and tried two years to get a house built. Uh, by it being a historical district, there's a lot of rules and regulation about building homes out there. And it just kept taking a turn for the worse. And we didn't want to sell the land because we really felt like we were sent there by God's divine uh, intervention. So... I began, I decided, well, I got all this land on the other side. What can I do? And garden was the first thing. Uh, so we had a sample soil. Uh, the soil was great. The only thing was the means of going there and tilling up and, and planting. Where did you get the soil sample done at? We do that at UK Extension Office there on Harry Sykes Road. Black Soil came out and helped us with uh, some soil sampling. We had also did some soil sampling in uh, Nanny's land, like Jane had said earlier. We also did the, we did the sampling soil at the same time for both places in 2019. And the soil came back where it would sustain a garden. So at that point, we started tilling and putting the fence around and then doing the infrastructure. The only negative thing about Green Landing, it does not have running water. We never built the house. So we are transporting the water from our home in Lexington to the site. So we try to keep four 50 gallon uh, rain barrels full with water every week. So that's about the only setback I would say that this garden is not having running water. Or electricity out there. So when you guys brought the property, it was just like land, that's it, nothing else. Uh, it was an old home. There are maybe a two bedroom, but it was uh, it was ready to be tore down. Uh, so. Electricity to me is not that of importance because usually when it gets dark, we leave. Cape Town Baptist Church is behind us and they have a street light. But that has not been to me uh, negative. But if we want to have a group of people out there and we want to do you no know, events, then you, we will probably have to be able to start doing, having electricity out there for that. How do you guys get water out there? Over 20 years, almost 30 years now, we've been living in Lexington. And so we just use the faucet you know, coming out of the side of the house and fill up, what are they, five-gallon buckets, and then we just transport that in our pickup truck over to um, Caden Town site, which is about a 20-minute drive through Lexington. And uh, we just pour those buckets into the 
50 gallon rain barrels that we have so it's a lot of twist the knob allow the buckets to fill up and then can't fill the bucket up too much still have to be able to carry it and not spill water and then get those buckets into the truck and then get the truck over to Caden town unload the buckets off the truck and then transport the buckets from the truck to the rain barrels and pour the buckets into the rain barrel so it's a very um intensive activity and it definitely is a drawback it builds muscles it builds muscles and character huh yeah yeah and they teach you how to balance yourself when you got one maybe four pounds four gallons of water and the other one maybe three you got to learn to be consistent so you can be able to carry from the truck over and there's a little creek that separate the property but we've always had the water test and it has so many uh we don't know where the water's coming so it's not safe to use that creek water for the produce. Now we can use the creek water for our marigolds. We have marigolds, mums, zinnias, all kind of flower daisies around the property. So we can use the creek water for that. So we don't waste our effort on the flowers, but we got to make sure we use uh, good water for the produce and we, yeah. and we make sure that happens. So the 80 by 20 is what you guys started with, right? Now, yes, sir. out of that, have you guys grown past that 80 by 20 or how how big is the property that you're trying to water? Uh, we have grown three times since then. Cause with last the year last year we tilted up about eighty by forty, right beside it, and put up trellis, which is uh cow panels. We bend those and made a trellis for my uh, mustardine grapes. And so, and then we went a little bit further and created a place for a picnic table, uh, seating. We also now have a raised bed that is waist level. It's about maybe a 20 by 20. It's pretty big raised bed that I can just work standing. Uh, and then we had a little sitting area that was so beautiful. And it had uh, a willow tree, two willow trees. But as everybody know, last year, KY came, KU. KU came and started cutting down trees. And our logo is a willow tree, Green Landing. That's where I got the the name from where they cut down our willow tree and so it is like a big sitting area now so wh wait why did they come and cut the trees down because the uh, electricity line were not close but it was close enough so they cut down the willow tree okay oh. you had an ordinance where um if trees were close to their power lines within a certain uh footage of the power lines and they were able to come through and instead of just pruning the trees how they have been in the past they now decided to just cut them down completely and so there was a lot of um outrage and pushback from citizens and it wasn't just in lexington i believe it happened all throughout kentucky wow and so uh yeah it's just another thing that we've kind of had to deal with and push forward through Did you know that CFA is a nonprofit organization that supports family farms, equity work, food access, and policy work across Kentucky? If you're interested in supporting any of this work, please go to cfaky.org and go to our donate tab in order to donate or become a member today. We really appreciate any and all help that we get and it goes back to helping both farmers and consumers across the bluegrass state. For more information, go to www.cfaky.org. Once again, that's www.cfaky.org. Thank you. And now back to our show. Before we left, you had mentioned um hey you coming through and cutting down trees which i mean gosh this sounds terrible what other ways have you guys been resilient with the land well before ku came in 2021 they also came in 2020 20 someone had reported us our neighbors because they just didn't know what we was doing over uh i guess that's what they was doing so we got reported and ku came by in 2021 and said i don't think that you can be uh tilling on this property right here and so we asked and we asked for documentation and it appeared that we our garden wasn't tall enough to hit the wire line so they let it go 
So you can't uh, have anything that is going to interfere with the, the power line. So the garden was not in power line way. It was not close to anything. So they allowed it. But then the next year, again, KU came down and was cutting everybody trees. We asked why they just didn't trim ours because it was part of our logo. And they said it was just easier to chop it down than to uh, prune it. But the good thing that came out of they did leave us or about five truckloads of mulch from all the trees they had cut down. So that allowed us to do that area I talked about uh, that we did the next year where we uh, tilled up the tra uh, the trellis and had the educational area. I want to call it education area because we had 14, about 14 kids came out this year from uh, Parks and Rec. And we was able to give them an educational day in that area where that mulch that we used from the tree. So that that was a positive thing. We got free mulch for that piece of property. Another moment of resiliency uh, that I will speak on is having to deal with uh, animals and insects. So, you know, after the first year, we had a real successful first year. And I guess we planted too good of stuff. And so animals told their friends and the insects laid eggs and the frogs laid tadpole eggs in our rain barrels. And so <laughs> the past two years, uh, we've been having to deal with animals and insects. But I will say another farmer mentioned to me that we should always grow in three, thinking of, you know, one, one crop getting destroyed by the weather and nature one crop being aided by the insects and the animals, and then hopefully that third crop will be left alone and that will, will be for us to reap and enjoy. So we always try to plant at least three seeds of uh, whatever crop we're planting, or excuse, at least three rows, so that you know if weather is bad, then one row will be uh, messed with by the weather, and then the next row will be messed with by animals and insects, and that third row will be left alone, and we will still have produce to reap and harvest. That's a great way for me to segue into one a new thing that I wanted to start. What is a tip that you guys have as farmers for other farmers listening? Uh, well, first thing, if you're going to really be a true farmer, you have to have the time and the patience. Uh, because you can go out there and water one day and things look well. And if you skip two days, it seems like everything's just changed. So you got to keep an eye on things. Uh, but the benefit for me is the fact that you can take seeds from tomatoes, throw them in a compost. And next year you come back, you got tomato plants growing out of the compost. You take that compost, which we did and put it in our raised bed. We have a tomato uh, patch that we didn't even tempt to put a seed out. Uh, the marigolds, you know, they drop their seeds. So it, it, you can just basically understand that most of every produce that you grow has something in it that is gonna allow you to grow next year if you choose to use it for that purposes. Because we left the mustards out there in 2020, came back and they had seeded. And you can take those mustard seeds and have mustard for the next year. Uh, we talked to the extension often. They were like, well, don't use those seeds from those mustard seeds because they're not going to produce, but they did. And we had mustard greens for the next year. So it just learning and just uh, learning the land and learning what you can and cannot do and then pushing the envelope to do a little bit more gotcha. of what you learn. Mm -hmm. My tip would be um, community, which sounds weird, but with right. farming, you're not by yourself, you know, just because you might be out there by yourself farming. Doesn't mean that down the road, there's not someone else trying to start a garden or that already has a farm going or a garden going. So the key with farming is to find others that are around you or even not around you that can offer you resources, labor, or even just more helpful advice, tips and suggestions. Because um, you know you can't do everything by yourself, and the more that you talk with others, the more that you can learn and you can spread around. So, while we were on break, you mentioned a uh, particular animal that is causing terror <laughs> in the garden. Talk a little bit about that one, James. Yeah, I talk about the groundhog since that's my mom's uh, rival. That's her nemesis right there. But, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so, yes, we started the garden 2019-2020, and it's now 2022. And so each year we have tried to increase what we do with our growing sites. And so this year we tried to do a 100 flower patch and representation of my mom's sorority, them celebrating their centennial year. So we tried to do a hundred flowers representing San Miguel Monroe sorority, but I don't know if that was more him, nature, or what. But we couldn't get blooms to take, and blooms that we did see, they wouldn't be there the next day. And so um, we even tried a pumpkin patch this year. And so you know, with those sweet blooms, uh, the gophers and any other animals were having a field day with that. And so we had bird netting, and we've tried putting out bird netting. Uh, but as the plants grow, the blooms pop out of that netting and the groundhog is still able to get to it. And so uh, this year, I guess we've had to deal with more disappointment than anything. And so that's been something that we kind of had to take on the shoulder and just keep trying to move forward and trying to be successful. But, you know, we don't want to harm any animals, especially not kill or anything like that. But, you know. That groundhog is pushing the <laughs> envelope. So I was gonna ask, did you guys make groundhog stew yet, or have you? Seen <laughs> no. a recipe? I keep saying we need to get a, uh, you know, the fake owl that sits out there, or how people will put fake birds and just different things. We've tried the mole spikes or gopher mm -hmm. spikes. It's a spike you put in the ground, and it emits a sound on a rotation and emits a frequency through the ground. And that was pretty successful our second year. But now that this third year, for whatever yeah. reason, um, they just coming in. Yeah, they don't care. They don't They're care. coming in through the fences. We'll put in a piece of wood, you know, patch up that hole, and then they'll come in two Ooh. inches down and come start another hole. So yeah. I think this year we we tried planting more fruit this year, and so just that sweetness, and we planted different flowers. Uh, it just was more of an invitation than rather to stay out. Yeah, James called it a 24 hour super supermarket or restaurant because they can come after we the, when it gets dark, they there until the light come and just enjoying everything in the garden. Farmers Market Support Program Services. Did you know that a program like this exists in the state of Kentucky? If your market has been around for a while, or maybe you are a new and existing market, we offer marketing development. We also offer business development. We want to offer programs as such like capital support to support your market managers. There's a cost share program. We can establish your market with the SNAP EBT program. And lastly, we provide networking. For more information, please contact us at cfaky.org forward slash FMSP. Again, that is cfaky.org forward slash FMSP. a little bit about um, how you guys budget the land and what you're doing with budgeting and while you're moving forward well with the green landing uh we like i said we got the fed county conservation grant each year so we're not selling anything out of green landing because that money was given to us to have a community garden and my purpose was to try to be a george carver wa uh, wa washington uh and just grow and you know take one thing and make all kind of stuff but our peanuts uh, have not been as successful as George, but we still, every year we apply for it. And this year, the first year we had 12 kids, which was great. It was three families and they came out during the day and we had a ball, we harvest, we till, we cultivated, we learned. The next year I only had six kids and it was so hot, those kids didn't really want to come out. And this year we're down to four kids. So you can tell it's hard to get kids to want to come out and far and garden because it's hot out there and you know and it takes a while uh for our pumpkin it takes 100 days for a pumpkin to come through so that's a long time for a child to sit and wait from a, a a seed a plant a bloom and a pumpkin i mean that's almost four months that's a long time well that's three months and a half so um i try to find seeds that mature 
40 to 30 days so they can see something. And radishes is about the only thing that you can put out there. But kids don't like radishes. Uh, so we start a herb box. And we have uh, cilantro, basil, sage, two peppermints. And, and that's been a lot that we've been giving to the community. People love little herb baskets. They're really cute. We got them in little uh, white uh, sheer package, and people have asked for those. So we've been able to do herbs, uh, and we usually give those away. But that's not part of the conservation grant, so we could sell those. And then UK blesses this year uh, with almost, I don't know, 100 plants. They have, a, I guess, a greenhouse on campus, and we got a call from Jamie Docker. Of uh, extension, and he said, I got all these flats. I'm going to sit some out for you. We came there with a truckload of flats. So there was probably 12 different tomatoes, all the herbs I talked about, peppers. So we grew a lot of different things this year because UK had provided those for us. And the year previous, uh, the seeds that we provided to the students that did the garden program, we got those through Seed Leaf. Mm -hmm. who was giving free seeds to the community uh, through the public libraries. So I know a lot of issues for starting off farmers is capital, you know, is money to do stuff. And for us, uh, we were just fortunate and blessed to receive grants and uh, be blessed with opportunities for free seeds, free seeds. And so we've actually, you know, been able to, I guess, uh, budget, on a different basis rather than on a, a rationing out basis. It's more about this is the money we have. How are we going to spend this money on fencing, this money towards supplies and tools, you know, this money towards helping with the water supply. And so it's really been a blessing to be able to receive those grants and uh, not have to go into necessarily our own pockets and personal savings as much as a lot of beginning farmers do have to deal with. Yeah. The CFA, the people who are sponsoring this, gave us a grant during COVID. When right. COVID was here in 2019, they had money for those farmers who just couldn't sell or the crop, and we got money for our strawberries. And that was a blessing to be able to get over 100 strawberries to put on property. Based on the fact that you guys worked a lot of things out through you know, budgeting and um, you got grants, you know, and selfishly, I want to know this. Was it hard to do the whole grant writing and the paperwork for it? It's not really that hard. You just got to give a purpose and a reason how you're going to spend the money and how the money is going to help the public. Because the conservation, you know, that's all dealing about uh, soil, preserving the soil, uh, water, natural resources. So when you say you're going to teach kids how to start a garden and that's improving the land, that's uh, keeping the land uh, for the purpose of what it is. I didn't have a hard time. Uh, I just had to be in more detail. And the most hard thing would be probably getting pictures of the things you're going to buy so they can support the line items. So uh, uh, Amazon is great for that. You just actually type in what you're going to buy, even though you may not buy from Amazon, but Amazon helped me a whole lot with my inventory uh, okay. and getting the pricing. Can you explain what's Third Thursday at uh, Kentucky State University? Okay, so Kentucky State University, uh, for those who don't know, historically black college slash university located in Frankfort, Kentucky, and um, it's a land grant institution. And so with them, you know, they have a heavy focus on agriculture, aquaculture, and um, also Aquapon other aquaponics now, aquaponics mm -hmm. or hydroponics. And so Kentucky State, they offer these things on the, was it the last Thursday or third, third last Thursday? Thursday? Mm -hmm. So third Thursday of the month, third Thursday, where they just talk about different things. And so each third Thursday of that month has a specific topic. So one month they were talking about pawpaw, the fruit and pawpaw trees. Another month they was talking about, you know, sustainability and ecosystems. You know, another month they might be talking about organic production and trying to become organic certified. And so it's just a really good uh, thing that Kentucky State does and opens it up to the public to allow people to come and just receive information from experts and professionals and leave with, you know, more knowledge than you already had. Now, 
out of that process on third Thursday, how often do you go and, and what do you feel like is the biggest benefit for you when you're there? I go every, I've been every Thursday this year, but last week and I uh, just watched it live on YouTube and then come Thursday, we're going to West Kentucky for the small farmer, black farmers association uh, at Mary state university. We are going to be a business historical Cherokee state park. If people don't know anything about historical che- historical Cherokee State Park, it was the park for segregation, where that was the only park that black folks could go to uh, back in 1959 to 1964, I believe. Uh, it's located in Aurora, Kentucky. We'll be, K State is taking a bus down there. So we'll be going down there on Thursday, leaving at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Anybody listening, we still got seats if you want to go. Uh, but I, I attend basically every Thursday. Uh, every month and I just always come back with information grant related we have never taken a loan out for our farm for three wow. years not taking a loan out no reason to because we budget with the money we have and we're not trying to do more than what we producing or what we bringing in but I tell you if you go to those third Thursday you got Department of Agriculture there you got uh, American Farmland you have so many entities that K-State bring to you and they all got money they trying to give away uh, you just got to sit down and understand the requirements because I don't know if we're going to talk about our rye grant, but we got a rye grant from the American Farmland Trust. They was holding it for trying to get some Afro-American uh, people. It's for a farm that's 25 acres or less. And I was at a Kentucky woman uh, farm event in Crestwood, Kentucky, and I was there, probably four of the black ladies were there. And they came up and they approached me saying, we really want some people of color to get into this grant. Uh, I brought it back to James and they came out and visit. And they said, oh, you qualify. It has not been a positive thing at all. They came out to our site in Launchburg, which is my grandmother's land. And her land, uh, she used to lease it out for tobacco growing back in the 70s and 80s. But nothing has been grown on the land since. So for at least the past 40 years, the wow. land has been untouched. But she has nine acres that she owns out in Lawrenceburg. And we're only growing on a half acre of that. And then there's two homes on the property. So that takes up another acre. So that still leaves us, you know, about seven and a half acres, seven acres of untouched land. And so American Farmland Trust came out and saw the land and thought that we would be able to, I won't say, you know, if they thought we'd be successful, but they thought we'd be able to grow a cover crop of cereal rye. And the purposes of the cereal rye was to later be harvested and sampled to see if, uh, you know, they would be able to do something with this rye. Uh, Unfortunately, our rye didn't quite meet the requirements uh, post-harvesting for what they wanted to do, but that still was a result for them to learn, you know, uh, what we did versus how other farmers were successful. And so for us to be able to do this rye, we had to, number one, make sure we had a tractor, which we did have one on property, but that tractor is probably from what the 90s or <laughs> 80s or so, so at least a 30-year-plus tractor. Uh, and then we needed a big tiller to go through and till up the land. Uh, All the tillers we have are hand push tillers. Uh, So we had to purchase equipment for the tractor. The tiller was almost too heavy for the tractor. So we had to spend money on more maintenance for the tractor to make sure that it was up to par to be able to handle this new attachment. Wow. And then uh, me and mom, neither of us have really experience with driving a tractor or working one. And so, we uh, took a crash course with the our caretaker of Nanny's <laughs> Land, the uh, land manager there, Uncle Paul. God bless his soul. He uh, trained us in 30 minutes on how to use the tractor. And I'm sure he wish he would have taught us a little bit longer because we called him every day with uh, issues that was going on. And so uh, we had to learn how to use the tractor, learn how to use the rototiller. Uh, Nanny's Land is on a hill. The whole thing is a hill with sections of flat land here and there and there. And so just trying to work that tractor and that tiller on a hill, that was experience within itself. And then um, we had to go up through trees and Hmm. clear that land as well. And then, you know, we also uh, 
uh, eventually reached out to some elders in the community and received some help. And, you know, an elder came out on his tractor and helped us finish what we needed to do as far as tilling. But, um, you know, we just didn't get too much guidance through the process. And for us being first time farmers and that being our first time ever trying to do something to that scale and trying to grow, you know, a crop for a purpose outside of just, um, you know, eating it, it was a an experience. And so I could talk forever about <laughs> that, that raw experience and what we've been through, but, you know, they did um, say that we should be reimbursed, even if we're not able to sell the harvest. And so we're not able to sell our harvest, but we're still hoping on receiving that reimbursement. Kentucky Double Dollars, a program of Community Farm Alliance, supporting Kentucky farmers and families with over $300,000 in nutrition benefits matched in 2021. For more information or to find a location near you, visit www.kentuckydoubledollars.org. People tend to talk about everything's successful, everything's up and up, and it's not always the case. No. And, um, it is. Because we, we, we had to hand seed. We hand seeded what six acres of rye because we didn't have the equipment that goes behind the truck. So we just took our home, hand our hand thing, or and we just push, in a uh, push, spinner. push spinner, and we got it done. We walked about five acres worth of rye. Oh, yeah. Come harvesting time, the way the land is designed, a combine was not Big able to yeah. come and harvest it. So we had to hand harvest the rye. Oh, so. Goodness. Yeah, yeah, we was out there like ancestors, I'll say. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Working that rock. And, uh, we was determined we was going to do our part, and we did. We we raised rye. We had five acres. It was tall. Uh, it would have passed the uh, inspection. It passed the first inspection. But this is sit there, and we couldn't get American farming to find anybody to harvest. It sit for another month too long. And then it became bad. bad because it was sitting out there getting dry. If they had been harvested and put in a cool place, then we our rye would have been able to be used. So yeah, it just some things do happen. But we we went learning through process. It is definitely a learning process, and I'm yeah. like I said I'm glad you guys shared that story. Um, well, because we're almost coming up to the end, I got to make sure I get this question in. Everybody knows that this is the Blackberry series. <laughs> I have to know what berry best represents Green Landing KY. Uh, I think we both agreed on this. We would say strawberry, and uh, not just because you know we grow strawberries, and that's kind of one of our cash crops. But just thinking about a strawberry, uh, when we started in Lexington, we planted our first row of strawberries in 2020. And then in 2021, those initial plants have produced runners and basically created their own row of uh, new strawberry plants. And so going into Launchburg, we actually cut the daughter plants off of the initial plant of strawberries from Lexington and transplanted them in Launchburg and was told, you know, that was a waste of our time. I don't know why we would take old strawberry plants and try to replant them somewhere else. But we actually got our best berries out of three years from taking the daughters of the old plants and yep. transplanting them in new soil. And so just the fact that strawberry has that kind of resiliency, uh, green landing, we're green landing KY because we have three growing sites now. You know, we have one in Lawrenceburg, Anderson County, and then we also are trying to do stuff out in Western Kentucky and Hopkinsville, Christian County. And so the fact that a strawberry plant starts as a mother plant and then produces runners and creates daughter plants that also produce berries and produce, we feel that's a great representation of green landing. Dope. That is that. I, I'll give you that. As many times as I do not like hearing strawberries, I I got to the point where I'm like, oh my gosh, another person with strawberries. But yeah. <laughs> We looked up a list of berries, and so I think maybe some people just didn't try to get too prepared, and they said the first berry that came to mind. But, you know, 
strawberries do well represent what we try to do and you know our purpose and our mission and our values yeah and they still blooming that's right 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 now they will go out there once in a while and i'll go to the strawberry and pick me three or four and eat and that may be my lunch while i'm out there slaving yeah the strawberries <laughs> stay out there to make sure we don't pass out in the heat now they keep producing for us to pick oh, as we goodness. working out in the garden mm -hmm. that's nice that's nice well, is there any other thing that you guys would like to add before we close out this episode? Uh, for me, you know, I'd say as a younger guy, I'm 26, going to turn 27. And so, you know, a lot of people don't see the success and the viability in farming or they see that it has to be a generational thing. And, you know, just because your grandparents didn't start off doesn't mean that you can't find some land and start your own farm and start a homestead and you know take care of the generations to come and right. so for me that's one of the most important things about farming is legacy and then also opportunity you know i had mentioned community and so just with farming it's opened the doors to meet new people you know met you Vaughn, who gave us this opportunity to come on your podcast and talk with you and so you know if we weren't farming we'd be missing out on a lot more opportunities and a a lot more good hearted kind folk that we need more of in the world and so farming has been a blessing and um, i'm glad to be a part of it i could definitely agree to that and thank you guys because like you said it takes meeting somebody else and being a part of the agriculture community to to receive that type of blessing but like i always say real change comes from the ground up until <laughs> next time peace <laughs> Thank you.